everybody for coming today to Why check out a, Digital Breakout of You. Where is D you choose everything? All of the above. Because <laughs> we can't just choose one of those. We will talk about all of these things. I kind of wanted to get a feel about where you guys were in terms of Digital Breakout EDU, how much you've used it before, what you knew about it, so that I can spend a little bit more time on this. This is kind of what I was expecting a little bit, and, and really that's this is kind of how I have the presentation set up, is I will spend most of the time talking about how to make a digital breakout game spend a little bit of time on, on what it is, give a brief overview of it, and then how you can incorporate it into your classroom. So just a little bit about us presenters. Uh, my name is Leland Schwartz. Um, I'm the math teacher at Roland Story High School. This is my 15th year teaching high school math. I was at New Hampton for six years, then taught one year at uh, Woodward Ranger, and now this is my eighth year at Roland Story. Uh, also the, uh, the head wrestling coach at Roland Story. Um, and my Twitter handle is at Schwartz Math. If you want to follow me, then I will I can brag to my students that I have more than five followers. So. <laughs> my co-presenter today is Dan Rader. He's our technology director at Roland Story. He's the one that kind of turned me on to uh, Breakout EDU, and uh, then it kind of snowballed into digital Breakout EDU. And I've just got to say, before he goes on, that uh, I have like no part in this except for to click the arrows <laughs> and, and encouraging him. Not, not that I'm trying to like lay blame or anything because he's going to do a great job, but I don't want to take any credit for it either. And I will warn you, I don't really use Twitter a lot, but it's there. Every once in a while I post something and retweet some things. Okay, so what is Digital Breakout? Basically, if you're familiar with Breakout EDU, it's the same idea, same concept, that we need to work together as a team or individually with Digital Breakout EDU to solve a series of puzzles to figure out the codes, figure out the combinations to open a lock, to solve a puzzle. That's really all it is. It's all on the computer, it's all digital, and there are a lot of different techniques, there are a lot of different puzzles that you can create to incorporate into uh, the digital breakout game. I think what might be best, if you've never, how many people, maybe just by a show of hands, how many of you have played a digital breakout game? Okay, so not very many. So maybe what would be best, so let's take a look at a digital breakout. This is a digital breakout game that I created last Sunday. It took me a couple hours to do, and then I had my kids do this in class. So there's always a premise. You have your storyline. With this storyline, it's the pirate's treasure. On vacation to the beach, you have some downtime and decide to do some exploring along the shore. In a small cave, you spy an old bottle just barely poking out of the sand. When you dig it out of the ground, you discover a, le a letter and a map inside the bottle. You learn that in his dying days, a pirate <coughs> wrote the letter, passing on information of a buried treasure. Can you find the buried treasure and figure out how to open the locks? Good luck. So, maybe go ahead and scroll back up. Within here, maybe you can see it, maybe not, based on where you're sitting. There are some links hidden within some of the words. Uh, the letter is in purple, map is in purple. Go ahead and click on letter. This is going to be a clue that leads to solving one of the locks. So with this clue, what I did was I, I just found a, old, a picture of an old piece of paper. I put it on a Google drawing, and then I put this text in front of the Google drawing, in front of the, the 
picture of the paper. If ye be the scoundrel who's reading this letter, then I am long gone. My riches cannot follow me to the next life, and I have no one to pass them on to. So I bury them until ye can prove your worth. After all, I am a pirate, and I like a good challenge. So good luck in finding my treasure and opening the locks. Yo ho, yo ho, a pirate's life for me. Captain Pegleg Pollywogs. <laughs> and again, if you can see this, <coughs> some of the letters are in different colors. B, I, T, period, which the period was a difficult one for my kids to figure out that that was, uh, that was in gray. B, I, T, period. Maybe some of you are starting to figure out what this is. If you've ever used a bit.ly before, that's what this is. Uh, it says bit.ly, there's a slash for it, PT directions is what the letters spell out. So if they enter that link into a new URL, then it takes them to another location. Um, Dan, can you open up a tab and type that in? It'll probably pop up on mine. Um, nope, not that one. Actually, just go all the way up. Yeah. Slash PT directions. There it is. So with this one, I've also created a force copy, which is something that I'll talk about a little bit later on. Go ahead and click on that. And here's where a, I brought my content into the game. This is one of the places where I brought my content into the game. Just because I'm a pirate doesn't mean I don't know my order of operations. Solve the problems below and you'll find the location of the buried treasure. So then I've got a series of math problems right here. 2x plus y. I've given them the values of x and y. So if we plug those in, 2 times 5 is 10. Plus a negative 3 would give us 7. So if they put that in right there, then up pops another clue. Uh, go ahead and click back on the, the Pirate's Treasure tab. Go ahead and scroll back up to the map. Click on map. So here's the other piece to that puzzle. Basically, what that says is that they need to start at the snake then go to the pond, go left to the mountains, go up to Skull Rock, over to the teepees, down to the river, and then to the buried treasure. So that right there is a combination to one of the locks back on the home page. So go ahead and click back on the pirate's treasure. So right here, this is where all of the locks are set up. We've got a six digit lock, seven letter lock, six direction lock. So that six direction lock is the one that we just found by those clues. Um, if you start typing these in, and I, I gave them a little bit of directions with this, U equals up, V equals down, L equals left, R equals right. Uh, go ahead and put caps on and then type in up, left, up, right, down. Now at this point, if it does not have the correct thing in there, it has an error message, gotta check the map again. So within that, a lot of times I try to give a little bit of a clue as far as where you can find the answer or where, how you can get the answer to this particular puzzle. So that's where I'm saying check the map again. Um, no, I think we need one more left on that. Yeah. So once they have the right thing in there, then it doesn't show the error message anymore, so they know they have the right combination. Do you have any kids who just go through all four letters until it stops saying error? Um, if they did that, it would kind of be a waste of time <laughs> because it, there are so many combinations yeah. of these. Um, I haven't had anybody trying yeah. that. Now, on the six-digit lock, with that, you know, it does have the arrow that you can keep going up progressively one, but when I do this, I try to make it a, a big enough number that if they do that, they're going to have to go through thousands of numbers. So again, it's not going to, it's not going to be beneficial for them to do it that way. Um, so showing a couple of the clues right there. 
go ahead and scroll down. Um, based on the formatting, when, when I plug this in, these pictures, when I don't have this plugged into projector, it shows up on the right side over here. So here's Captain Pegleg, Pegleg Polywog. Within pictures, this is another place where you can hide clues. If you put the cursor over it, <coughs> nothing's happening, nothing's happening. You have to figure out where the link is. So with this, there's a link on the peg leg itself. So go ahead and click on that. Here's another place where I've included some content. With this one, this was again a Google drawing. I, I found it hard to put in square roots when I was working with, uh, with sheets or working with documents. So that's why I went to, went to this. So they have to go through. And this is the six digit combination. If they simplify each one of those. Okay, go ahead and go back to the home page. And then scroll down. We have one more picture on this. The link with this one is on the skull. So this is where I used a Google form. Um, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll show you what happens as we progress through this. So 12x minus 18. Yeah, we got that yet. Test your math skills today. Okay. And with this one, it does need to be a lowercase x. So what I did is set up one question on each page. And with this, this one isn't actually a question, but I have after every question that they answer, it's part of a, a riddle, a joke that they have to fill in. So it says, what did the pirate say? Then click on next. Then they have the next problem and have to go through. Uh, I, I believe I have three or four problems with this in the series. <coughs> Excuse me. And once they, once they figure this out, the riddle says, uh, what did the pirate say when he got his peg leg, or when he got his wooden leg stuck in the freezer? Shiver me timbers, yes, exactly. So it says shiver me, and then I have a blank for the seven spaces for the word timbers. So if we go back to the home page. Scroll up a little farther. That one is the seven letter. Okay. Now this one that I made was a, a fairly basic one compared to a couple of the others that I've made in the past and compared to some of them that I've seen. I designed this game specifically for them to work on it in class so that they, and so that they would have enough time to get it done in that time period. And as I, as I progressed throughout the day, I did this in uh, six of my seven classes. Um, first period, not a whole lot of people got it. There were, there were a few people, a handful of people. Um, second period, I don't think anybody got it in that. It was different from going from geometry to algebra. Third period, this geometry again, more people started getting it. Sixth period, a lot of people got it. I think there may have been some people chirping from period to period. So yeah, that, that happens a little bit. Um, I, I did make it clear with them not to say anything to the people in the later periods. Um, and for the most part, I think most of them did that. They, I believe there was one period though that I didn't mention it, so I'll blame it on those guys for, for telling the people later on in the day. Uh, but this right here is, is a good example of a digital breakout showing some ways and some different <coughs> kinds of clues that we can have. So let's go ahead and go back to the presentation. Here's another great resource for you where you can find the breakout games on the, the actual breakout EDU site. Again, if you haven't played around with it, that would be my biggest uh, 
biggest idea of help for you is go onto the breakout site, look at the games that they have on there, and if you're interested in designing your own games, play a lot of the games on here first so that you can get ideas of how to figure out, of how to place clues within your game. Go ahead and click the next one. So, talking specifically about how I make a digital <coughs> breakout game. Go ahead. Again, play some games. Go ahead. Uh, on the website, on the Digital Breakout EDU website, they have a great how-to page. Go ahead and click on that. We won't take a look at everything that's on here, but within the other website, there's a link to this one. Just click on the how-to. They have a they have a ton of videos right here. Most of them are very short, just a couple minutes long, that do a, a great job of explaining how to use some different things and you know anywhere from how to how to make the original page to using Google Sheets with conditional formatting, all sorts of things. So when I was starting to design my own, I think I looked at almost all of those. So it's a great resource to use. Go ahead and go back. Process again. Another tip that I would say is make sure that you stay organized. If you start designing your own breakout games, whether they're physical games or whether you're talking about the digital games, you're going to start having a lot of different documents, a lot of different pictures, uh, Google drawings, uh, just a lot of different things that you're using for your games. So make sure that you do stay organized. I have a, a folder that says Schwartz Breakout Games. Then within that, I have a folder for every game that I've created for the regular breakout games. Then I have another folder that says digital breakout. And then a folder within those for each digital breakout game that I've made. So just a, a tip that is very helpful. And then basically just start creating. So the first thing that you need to do when you're creating your game is to create a Google site. Um, let's go ahead and go right here. I'll show you exactly what I mean with this. If I go to I usually go through my email and I just go to Google Sites. So I just click on the create button. If you've never done this, it's really very easy. I just go to Google Sites, click on the create button. I usually just select a blank template. So I'll just say new digital breakout game. Now, when you do this, you can't go back and rename your site. So make sure that you kind of think about that ahead of time, what your, uh, what your storyline for your game is going to be. And, and make sure you put that in here. The second thing that I make is a Google form for my locks. In my drive, here's where I have Schwartz Breakout Games is right up the top. I've got all of these as different breakout games that I've made, as well as other resources that I use when I'm creating a regular breakout game. Here's my digital breakout folders, and here are some of the games that I've created. So within here, I would I would make a new folder, new digital breakout game, and then I'm going to create a Google form. So 
So within my Google form, usually I put the, the title of the game, say new game right now. I put in however many locks I decide to have. I can always go back and change this as I'm making the game and I, I feel like I, I have too many locks or I want to add another lock in there. I can always go back and change this as I'm doing it. So where it says untitled question, maybe here I'll put in a five digit lock. The next part is the most important part as far as making these into an actual lock. So I'm going to put it as a short answer. And to start off with, I usually just put something in as far as what I want the lock to be. I do, I go down and make sure that I click the required. And then right next to it, data validation. Okay, that's how you, that's how it actually becomes a lock, is through the data validation. So I click on that. <coughs> And I have some different options right here. With this one, it's a five digit lock, so I just want it to be a number. I need it to be equal to, then I can type in whatever I want into this. So I've made it a five digit lock, so I'll just say one, two, three, four, five right now. I usually just put something in, start creating my game, and then figure out what I actually want it to be based on the game, come back here, and then change it later. custom error text. It is very important that you put in a custom error text message. Otherwise, when they start typing something in, it's going to say, must include one, two, three, four, five in the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so it gives it all away. So I'll put, nope, try again. Then I'll add another question. Each question is its own lock. So this time I'll put in <coughs> about a five letter word. Again, I need to go back, make it short answer, make it required, data validation. This time I need it to be text. The thing about this one is that it can't be exactly five letters. It can only contain those five letters. So actually with the, the timbers was the code in the Pirate's Treasure. I did have some students enter Shiver Me Timbers and it accepted it, which that's fine. So right here I'll just do A, B, C, D. And sometimes right here I'll put, must be all caps. A clue with that, or I could go in and put in a description. So the description must be all caps. So that's basically it as far as making my locks. The next part, I go back in. Too many tabs now. this, I go back and I edit the page, so here's my storyline, storyline paragraph, insert, go to drive, I usually don't include the title with it. Um, I do include a border, but those are all settings that you can play around with. So there, if I save it now, <coughs> you'll be able to see this embedded in here. And then I just start building everything around it. 
I, I insert my pictures, I insert paragraphs, I insert the links, everything that I want for my game. And I just keep on going until I have everything that I want to. So you don't actually use the boxes? Nope. Nope, it doesn't use the box at all when we're doing the digital one. Okay. And, you know, comparing the two games, I, I love Breakout. You know, I, I fell in love with it last year. My biggest piece of advice for you, get a student teacher. <laughs> <laughs> last year I had a student, and get a good student teacher. Better put that in there. I, I had a student teacher last spring who was very good, and you know, once she was doing everything, this is what I was doing. <laughs> this is what I was doing while she was teaching all my classes. It, it was awesome. It was awesome. Um, I, I would be, and mostly it was with the regular breakout. I, I didn't get turned on to the digital breakout. <coughs> they didn't really create the digital breakout until late in the school year. Uh, I want to say around April is kind of when I started learning about and exploring the digital breakout. Um, so most of the time, though, when, when she was there, she would just look over me, look over at me sitting at my desk. And I'd just be staring off in space, trying to figure out how to connect one clue to another clue for my breakout game that I was making at the time and she would just look at me and, what are you doing? <laughs> so, get a student teacher. It's, it, it's helpful for your time to make your own digital breakout games. Yeah. yeah, this is connected through the resources on the iTech site. Yeah. So we talked about making those, and just building, adding until just everything is complete. Um, so some different things that you can include for your clues. White text on white background is a, a good clue. Um, there are, and again, if you look at some other breakout games, you're going to see that in there. A lot of times there's spacing or at the maybe at the bottom of the page below the Google form, there's just white text that you can't see at all. So if basically what I do whenever I am playing a digital breakout game, I go to the regular site, I just select a little bit of text anywhere on the page, and then I hit Control A to select everything. So then it shows all the white text that's on white background. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the way that they can figure it out that it's there. So white text on white background, colored or bold or italics letters, some way to show a difference in the letters, to highlight the letters uh, that will spell something like I did on the pirate's treasure. Hiding links in words without showing that there's a link. You know, when you create a link, <coughs> it automatically changes the word to a different color. A lot of times it underlines it. So you can go back and change that. Go ahead and click on the next one. Conditional formatting in Google Sheets. Also talked a little bit about that. Um, there is a hidden link on this page. Going back to number three. See if you can find it, Dan. Found it. Yep, go ahead and click on it. This is an example of those two things right there. Where you couldn't see that the link was there, but you have to move your cursor over it until you can find it, where the cursor changes. So how to force copy something, if you've never done that before, go ahead and put the mouse on the URL. Just hit the down button. So it goes all the way to the end right here. When you create something, there we go. When you create something, at the very end, it says edit. Whether it's a Google Sheet, whether it's a document, whatever it is, it says edit as the last word, and sometimes there's some other letters at the end of it. All you need to do is highlight everything at the end through the word edit, delete that, and type in the word copy. And then if you copy that URL, put it in as a link somewhere, whenever somebody clicks on that, it takes them to a page that's like this that says, would you like to make a copy of this page? So the reason that that is important is because it, you know in Google Docs and Google Spreadsheets, everybody who's on it can work on it at the same time. So if one person 
puts in the number seven as the answer, everybody else is going to see that too. So with this, they have their own sheet to work with, and it doesn't affect the game uh, to parade by else. That's a great tip for just in general for any time you're using Google Docs and you're handing out something like a worksheet or something to students and you need them to make a copy so that they don't answer it and everybody, the next class then goes on to see it and somebody's already answered all the questions. So I just learned that yesterday. That, that's a great thing. That's a nice tip. You just switch that into copy. Yep. Basically. Yep, that's all it is. Okay. Yep. Go ahead and click on making a copy for this one. <laughs> there is one of the how-to videos about how to do some conditional formatting, uh, but again, this is an example of how to use conditional formatting for this. It just goes to the same thing that we had before. Um, go ahead and click on, go ahead and type the 7 in for that one. So this again is really just using the white on white text. Uh, put the mouse on this one. So you can see up here, it tells exactly what it is. Head south to the river. Now some of the more savvy kids would maybe be able to find this. So what I did on this, if you go ahead and just uh, change this one to a different color. Actually, let's just change all of, all of these right here. A different color. We'll fill them in gray. So you can see all of them right there. I knew that some kids would maybe be able to figure that out. So I also put these out of order. So they don't start by going, by turning north at Skull Rock. They have to start at the snake. Then the next thing that pops up when they put the answer in here is to go west of the mountains and then north to Skull Rock, then right to the teepees, south to the river, and then follow the river west until you reach the treasure. So you kind of have to think about those other kids who are, are going to try to find ways around. I, I even had one kid last Monday who, I don't have any clue how to get there, but he was looking at the, um, at the code for the whole thing. And he, was, he figured out where the link was on the pirate, by doing that instead of just hovering over the pirate with the mouse. To me, that's more work. But you know, he, he found, out, found it out that way. So that, it also brings up an opportunity to talk with your kids about, you, know, you need to make sure you're playing the game within the context of it being a game, not trying to find these alternate ways to get there. Um, but you know, also kind of how you want to make it too. You know, See, if okay the kid can that. read through all the HTML code and everything like that, he can probably do uh, the absolute value of negative 3 plus 11, which I failed to do at first. So. <laughs> uh, go ahead and let me, let me show you how to do this part right here. If I click on format, conditional formatting, it brings up the conditional formatting rules for anything that's on the page. With this one, if I click on that, the custom formula is equals, and this is, you kind of have to learn how it works with this, but there's a, a dollar sign, B, dollar sign 10. So B10, if B10 is equal to 14. So here's B10. So if I type in a 14, then it changes that to this color. So this session isn't about how to use Google formatting or conditional formatting within Google Sheets. If you have questions on it and would like me to share more about that, I certainly can. Basically what I do though is I use the, the how-to tutorial. Excuse me. I use the how-to tutorial and then I, I found another sheet that has a ton, way more than what I use, uh, a ton of conditional formatting rules that I just pick and choose whichever one that I want to use at the time. Um, the ones that I've used the most are highlighting something like this, 
or putting in another number. I could also set it up where if this equals 14, then I can type in, then it'll show up the number 14 right there, something like that. Yes? I missed how you got to the conditional format rules. Did you just like right click on it? Or? Yep, I clicked up on format oh. and then down to conditional format. Fantastic. And, and I've also used that if I, if I talk about the students needing to play the game within the context of the game. I, I'll be honest, I, I've gone to that before and to, to help myself when I've been playing a digital breakout game and I don't know what to do. I go up and check to see if there are any conditional formatting rules within the sheet. So anyway, that's kind of what that one is. Going back to our presentation, we we'll talk about some of the others. <coughs> Hiding links in pictures, we, we've talked about that, showed an example of that already. Uh, okay, next link. Next slide. Google Forms. Um, we've talked about that a little bit. If you, I'm not going to go through each of those, but if you click on the link that's in this presentation, it shows another good example of how to use that. Jigsaw Planet is a good resource to use. What you can do with Jigsaw Planet is take any picture and you can put it on Jigsaw Planet and it turns it into a Jigsaw Puzzle. So then there can be clues within that. Maybe it's the picture itself. Maybe you can, uh, maybe you can put writing on the picture, so then once the puzzle is all put together, it'll say go to and then a website. Do I click on the next one? ThinFi, I'm not sure whether it's ThinFi or ThinFi. Anybody know? Anybody ever use this one before? This is a good one to password protect any link. So if I wanted to go to, say, one of my, I had one of the Google drawings that are on there and there's a link within that, I can put a thin phi on that link. So it takes, takes me to a page that says, what is the password? And you have to enter a password to get to that link. And it's just another thing that you can use. Google Maps, I've seen these used. I haven't actually used Google Maps myself. Um, there is a kind of a cool example. One of the, go ahead and click on this one. One of the first, maybe the first digital breakout game that I played uh, was called Black Forest Breakout. And that's the one that I made a link to right here. But within that game, it has this Google map within it. And it has there's so many directions you could go with this tour. You've got your mind tour itinerary <laughs> with you. These are the different locations that, that, had, that have been put on the Google map. And there's the tour itinerary, once you find that, it tells you what order to go within these things. So if we have the, the tavern right there, I won't try to pronounce it. If we have the tavern right there, maybe we need to go to the Mercure Hotel Panorama and then down to the next mine. So this was a directional lock. And this gave the answer to a directional lock. So kind of cool, uh, cool thing to use with digital breakout games. Go back. It's just taking all the clues and entering them into the Google form that's been put on the page. Okay. Yep. And I'll talk about what happens after they do put them all in. <coughs> History.com. Um, I've actually seen a lot of a lot of uh, pages from History.com uh, used in digital breakouts. Again, they're not ones that I've used before, uh, but you know, especially if working in history um, or, or anything with it deals with that, there, there's some really cool clues you can include through that. Snote is a, is a resource that you can use. You can hide up to four words within the Snote and you have to 
uh, turn it in order to see each one of the words. Uh, something to check out. Hide and see, again, another resource that you can use. I haven't used it. I actually just kind of learned about this one at the, uh, the breakout, one of the breakout games uh, that was played yesterday. Anybody, how many of you in here played the Curse of the Cubbies yesterday? Uh, they had, there was a snote in that, and they also talked about the hide and see with that. And Puzzle Maker, that one, is, you can make lots of different kinds of puzzles, crossword puzzles, word finds, a lot of different things that you can use in there. And then finally, don't forget to make your digital badge. Once you've got the whole thing made, uh, you can make a digital badge that you can share with your students after they complete it. So I talked about my folders in my Google Drive before. One of my folders is digital badges that I've earned by solving other digital breakout games. Um, and I, I also have the badges that I've created for my games. AutoCraft and Form Mule, Form Mule are both ways that you can, uh, they can enter in their email address and other, other fields in the Google form, within the Google form, and these will send a message back to those students that, uh, at the email that they provided. So this is usually what I do to set it up uh, so that once, they, once they're finished, it'll just automatically send their badge to them through that. And another thing that I would highly recommend, once you have your game created, ask people for help on it to see if there are any glitches. Uh, the Facebook page for Breakout is awesome. If you, know, if you haven't looked at that, I would highly encourage you to join the Facebook page for Breakout. Uh, there are definitely some great resources. You can get some really good ideas. And anytime I make a digital Breakout game, I put it on there, I say, hey, would anybody like to play my game to see how it works? And most of the time, within 20 minutes, I have half a dozen people who are playing the game already and ready to give me feedback once they're done with it. So there's a digital breakout Facebook as well as? No, it's, a, it's the same Facebook the page. Same, okay. As far as how I use them within my classroom, okay, that's kind of the <coughs> overview of how I make digital breakout games. The way that I incorporate them into my classroom, there are a couple different ways. Um, I have used them to review material before. Last year, before semester tests, at the end of the year, I created a digital breakout game for algebra and one for geometry. Those were the two classes that I taught last year. And those, those really were my first games that I made, and I definitely went overboard with them. Um, they were a little bit too long. Some of the kids said that they spent several hours working on it, and some of them got it, some of them did not get it. I do think that it, if they were working on it, it was a good review for them. The thing that's nice about it is you can't just move on when you have the right answer. You have to get the right answer in order to progress through the game. So it, it teaches them, it forces them to stick with it until they have it right. That's one of the things that I really love about it. You can also use it to introduce new concepts. We talked about using the history.com pages. You know, it's a great resource to take them to a location. They have to learn something new and then they can use it within the game. Another thing that I really like about digital breakout games is you can do them in class, you can do them out of class. The one that I did last Monday was the first time that I'd actually used it in class. And I, I thought they did a great job. Everybody was engaged. Every single one of my students, I got them together in groups of two or three, and they were all working on it together. But you can also do it outside of class. Now, the review one that I made last year, I, I did those as extra credit, and they just did them outside of class. So, other thing that I like about it is that it can be as individuals, or you can work on them in groups. The thing with breakout games is that you want them 
You want the kids to be collaborating. You want them to be problem solving. You want them to be working together. And you can do that with digital breakout games, or if it's something where you do just want them working on it on their own, they want to be doing it at home, they can certainly be doing that too. So I love the versatility of it. You can make it into whatever you want. I think I probably like the digital breakout games a little bit more than the physical breakout games. But I love them both. Where are we doing on time? Quarter time. All right, perfect. What questions do you guys have? And yeah. maybe you said this, but have you had students create their own after they've played a couple now? Do you have them? Not yet. Not yet. But that, that is something that I will be having them do in the future. Because that would be good for a review, too, is to have them create yeah. their own. Definitely. Definitely. You know, especially, I've been playing around with the idea. I, I, I've traditionally been a very traditional teacher. And you know, I'm trying to get these other ideas in there and work playing around with a little bit of self-paced learning. And you know, this can definitely be something that I have them do. They progress through and show that they have mastered the basics or the chapter that we're working. Okay, go on. I want you to make a digital breakout game for this chapter. So it's definitely something that I'm going to have them do in the future. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Have them, you know, put the onus back on them. Right. One of the disadvantages to having students make the digital ones is you kind of give them some clues on how to solve them <laughs> without actually solving them in the future. Like he showed you how to highlight all the text uh, that was white on white and some of that type of stuff. So they kind of learn some of the little tricks when you have them do those. But uh, you just have to learn how to stay one step ahead of them and figure out better tricks. Which, which is okay, too, because after they've played a couple, they're going to pick up on those things yeah. anyway. Which they may learn new tricks and teach you. Oh, definitely. I hope they do. <laughs> well, and, and one of the things uh, Leland alluded to earlier uh, when he was talking about the one, this one that he had just had, uh, the seven periods do, he, you know, he said geometry uh, did a little bit better. It's not because they were in geometry, but because they had been exposed to the breakout EDUs last year in his algebra class. Um, not that the geometry students could solve those problems better. It was just that once they've done a couple of them, they start figuring out now, like he said, you know, I know there's probably something in here if I kind of move my mouse around, I'm gonna have to click on something. And when it's the first time, uh, they're just not used, they don't know what they're looking for. And, and that was definitely something that we talked about because my geometry classes are made up of about two thirds sophomores and one third freshmen. So the sophomores definitely had the advantage over the freshmen because they had done the one previous year. <laughs> it, it can take as short or as long as you want. You know, the, the ones that I made last year took a lot of time. Uh, this one that I made took me two to three hours. Somewhere around there. So, Nothing too bad, um, but it, you know it does take time. Um, we use Google Classroom. I don't know anything about Google Classroom. I've never worked with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, it really is whatever you make of it. You know, you can take it in any direction. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate your attendance. Thank you for coming.